Talking TV with you. Screen time up next. You know, I think we really need to be in front of a television set. Do you have a television? Well, yeah, you know we have two of them. Wow. Why aren't there so many cooking shows? Well, it's a license requirement in Australian television, Brian. You can't get a license if you don't have a certain number of cooking programs. Right. Could you be quiet, please? I'm trying to watch my favourite program. <laughs> Hey, I was watching that. Good evening and welcome to television. Welcome to television. And today we are talking Unorthodox, a German-American drama miniseries that debuted on Netflix in March. And it's in primarily spoken in Yiddish, loosely based on Deborah Feldman's 2012 autobiography, Unorthodox, The Scandalous Rejection of My Hasidic Roots. It is an extraordinary deep dive set partly in the Satmar sect of Hasidic Jews in Williamsburg in Brooklyn about a young woman who tries to escape. You escaped, didn't you? You make it sound like I was in prison. Weren't you? No. But I left without telling anyone. Why did you leave? God expected too much of me. Where I come from, there are many rules. My family just cares that I'm a good wife and mother. I had to get as far as possible for my community. So, will you help me? And here we find ourselves in Berlin. The series is actually shot in Berlin and they make an amazing fist of making parts of it look like Williamsburg in New York. It tells the story of Esti, a 19-year-old Jewish woman living very unhappily in an arranged marriage in her ultra-Orthodox community, which is real. It does exist in downtown Williamsburg. In fact, a lot of the members of that community say they're sick of being treated like uh, creatures in the zoo. Tourist buses come by filming them as they live a really quite remarkable life and a very different and very cordoned off life from the rest of society. What rich material for a TV series which is now streaming on Netflix. Ben Michael joins you now, head lecturer of the Masters of Screenwriting course at the Victorian College of the Arts. Ben, good to talk again. Good morning. It's lovely to be chatting. It is great material. And of course, mm. uh, again, with really good drama, it's character driven. So tell us about the characters and uh, how they make this show work or whether indeed you think they do make it work. Yeah, look, uh, off the bat, I thought this was remarkable TV. We were chatting, you know, a month or so back about um, high end television and uh, whether or not we measure up in this country. And I mean, this is one of those examples of the high you know, how high the bar is. Uh, for, I just absolutely loved it. Um, it's everything that, uh, it's like a movie that goes on. It's like a movie that gets time to kind of really get stuck into the characters mm. and the stories and take you on an amazing journey across more time than a film can. And yeah, it's absolutely, the characters are amazing. Shira Haas, who plays uh, Esty, the main character, and it's, it's one of the great performances I've seen recently. Um, and you are, you you believe all the characters. Look, the only characters I didn't believe, I thought the, her German kind of university pals were like kind of hashtag diversity where they were like kind of ridiculously perfectly diverse, but that's kind of a really minor, um, a really minor criticism. The actual, the central characters of um, Esti and her husband, Yankee, uh, and his um, uh, cousin, Moishi, who go over to try and bring her back from Berlin. Those three kind of performances were so beautiful and so nuanced. And I love that they didn't, they never kind of went, here's the good guys and here's the bad guys, although clearly it is about a woman escaping a, a pretty repressive, um, uh, you know, religious orthodoxy. Mm. But I think we, I loved how with Yankee, her husband, we got to see him, like a really beautiful performance, I thought. And his, the, the, the scenes together towards the end were just completely heartbreaking where you see that he's as much a prisoner as she was, but he's probably too scared to make the kind of courageous move to break out in the way that she did. Although I noted in the book that her husband eventually left that Hasidic community as well. Yeah. Lots of texts coming in. Clearly, a number of you have managed to hook on to orth unorthodox, and you've enjoyed it too. Give me a call. Let me know what you thought. Let's talk about this show. Um, if it works, why it works, and what has been for you so interesting about the story and the way it's done. One three hundred triple two seven seven four. Because I think the thing really to talk about with you this morning is when. Uh, an outsider goes into a very different kind of community like this, whether you're talking about the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community or let's say you're talking about a different ethnic group or a different time and place. If you don't write the script well and if you don't cast it correctly, it can come off looking kitsch and gratuitous mm. so easily. 
you can slip over into that space, I think, without even realising that you are. So the question for you, dear listener, this morning is whether or not this show does that, if you've seen it. one three hundred triple two seven seven four. Ben, here are some texts coming in. Absolutely superb show. So nuanced too. Although mm. I agree about the PC Berlin Diversity Group. <laughs> um, and also... Is it The Handmaid's Tale on a small scale, asks Lee, and we can talk about that in a moment. And this is, well, great program, but it may be angry to think that women can still be treated this way. Ben, do you think it manages to speak from within and inside and of the community while, while at the same time clearly being highly critical of much of that community? I think it definitely does. It's not like uh, someone like myself would go and write it who doesn't have any experience with that. I mean, clearly it's based on Deborah Feldman's book, but also um, the writers of the program, Anna Winger and Alexia Karolinski, who were friends of Feldman's, uh, uh, obviously have a um, roots in that community and a deep understanding of it. And I, I think the way they're able to show us the rituals and the... Mm. Um, the inner workings of that community had such verisimilitude for me that I, I was left in no doubt that I was looking at, I was being brought into a world that I had no idea about and was being shown it in a very, I think, very honest way. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about great stories that you kind of go like, I, I spent my um, late teen years, the first place I moved out to was East St Kilda when I uh, left home. And uh, that community was all around me and I was fascinated by it. But because it is a closed off community, I had no sense of what actually goes on there. And so to be able to be brought into that community and to see it, um, you know, it, and it was there were some beautiful parts of it as well. So I don't, I don't think it was something that was going, this is all necessarily evil. And I think they also did a beautiful job of saying there's a reason why communities become very um, isolated. And yes. if you have something appalling happen to you, which clearly did, exactly. you can't sit there and go, well, there's no reason for, you, for people to be like that. You go, man, there is a reason for people to be like that. that. It's that not was, an excuse. That's but, yeah. right. There was a lovely moment in the script around that and anyone who sort of wondered about um, the ultra-Orthodox Jewish communities and, and the, the big families that they have, she, she turns to a character at some point, and this, this amazing actor, Shira Haas, who, who looks almost like a, a creature from another world, a doll mm. with those big white eyes and that tiny, small doll-like face. And she says, well, I, I had to get pregnant. I, I had to have babies because we're replacing the six million Jews. Yeah. And the line just falls into the scene and and you're suddenly taken aback and thinking, well, of course you are. Of mm. course, this has become a, a mission of, of your part of the Jewish community to replace the six million. And so mm. we have to have babies. And it was a it was a phenomenal, simple moment of script writing. Absolutely. And that's I think that's that thing with um we kind of, uh, I mean, we've kind of, science has kind of been telling us that trauma can be, is inherited, that we inherit trauma from our, yeah. yeah, 100%. And so to sit there and go, um, I mean, I, I love programs that make you go, where am, what am I a fundamentalist about? What am I, what are my views that can, <laughs> that can be, you know what I mean? Because we all sure. have it. We're all fundamentalist about something. And, th and there's a reason for that. If you, if you, you know, look at what you're, you're a fundamentalist about and trace it back, it, there'll be some kind there'll of trauma or... 100%. Yeah. Ben, we have so many callers. Let's try oh, and good. quickly get through. And I've got board after board of, of messages. So people really embrace this show. Franco in Richmond, though, has a remarkable story to tell, I think. Franco, good morning. Good morning. I just love that show. It showed such strength, affirmation, and this character was just wonderful. But the scene that really touched me was when um, she meets the friends and they go to the park in, in Berlin. And to me, then they, they go out swimming and she follows behind and she wades into the water, just takes off the wig that she's had for so long <clears throat> and, uh, and just sort of sinks into the water and to me that was like a religious baptism into her new life mm. and it really really touched me it, it, it was a, a lovely sort of parallel to the ritual bathing um, that the Orthodox Jews go through at the end of their menstrual cycle and the likes of, but it was a parallel where this was a, a uh, her baptism into her own selected freedom as you say Franco it's a beautiful yes. observation thanks mm. for calling in Richard's called in from Caulfield hi Richard yeah, how are you going? Hi, I'm well. How are you? Very well. Um, just called in about uh, Unorthodox. It was a really fantastic show. And one thing to notice is uh, the story in the show is really unique and it doesn't happen that often, I don't think. Mm. Um, so in a sense, while we're all celebrating uh, the success of, of that, that girl in kind of escaping, 
it's worth remembering that these communities exist um, amongst all religions, really. I mean, I'm Jewish, um, but, it, but it is quite broad-based. And most people just put up with it and enable that kind of cycle of repression to, to continue and don't make that escape. Hmm. Is it something that bothers you about um, the, the more orthodox communities here in Melbourne as well? Yeah, completely. I had um, some distant cousins who were, who were members of, of the community in Melbourne, mm. um, and the kids have really tried to kind of find their place outside that community. But the problem is, as soon as anyone tries to change anything from the norm, uh, they're basically banished, um, mm. you know, and and shunned from that community, and, and their whole roots and background just disappears. So it's quite mm. a big step for people to take. Was it hard for you to watch it, Richard? Yeah, it was, um, especially the dichotomy, like the beautiful parts of the culture and, and religion mm. uh, kind of overlaid over that uh, repression aspect. I mean, the wedding scene was just so strange. I've never been to a wedding like that, but certainly some aspects are, are common amongst, you know, just general Jewish weddings. That we were trying not to spoil too much, but Richard, thank you so much for calling in. But yes, that yeah, wedding right. scene, uh, oh, then, yeah. that, that, that almost took us in, into the realm of, well, something like natural history. I mean, it was being filmed yes. like uh, like the National Geographic might go to a, a remote community somewhere in Tibet and show you rituals mm. that you've never, ever seen before. No, it was amazing. Yeah, and it was that, it's that other thing as well where we, you never want to sit there and go, I'm, I'm so removed and I'm so, you know, whatever my culture happens to be is so much better than that because usually if you just go back an extra 100 years or whatever, you'll be in exactly the same, exactly the same boat. <laughs> yeah, it's just a matter of a small amount of time, but it very much felt yeah. like that. It was that wedding scene is just something else. Yeah. Terry has called in from Box Hill. Hi, Terry. Um, hi, Virginia. Um, yes, I came across Unorthodox just browsing the you know you know Netflix and then I thought oh this sounds interesting I'll start watching it and and I was completely and utterly hooked and and um, hooked on it and addicted and I thought oh I want to watch another episode and another episode and before long I'd watched the whole series and <laughs> and I I sort of felt I was wanting more you know um, well you'd like to see uh, again we're not we're gonna be very careful here and not spoil so let's not say too no, much but, but it was it was you would very want to see well what act- happens next in her life. Pardon? You'd want to see what happens next in her life. Yes, yes. Um, but um, I just found it quite absorbing. I, I found that she was very fortunate to to meet those um, university students who, you know, she sort of completely trusted because she came she came there not knowing a soul and not having nowhere to go. And and when you arrive in a strange country, um, the first thing you want to have is a place to stay and um it made me feel quite scared actually you know and mm. um and she had virtually no money and um yeah it's it was yeah. it was incredibly confronting and as you say very well done amanda's mm. calling from central victoria hi amanda hi how are you good thanks um i don't know if I want to say that um i just wanted to alert people at the end of the show uh, 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 they, no, no 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 spo- no 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 not not the story there's a there's an actual program at the end of the show that shows you the making of the show yes, yes and that right. is so fabulous and i think and i a friend of mine said to me make sure you watch that at the end and you know you find out about moshi who you know like that he's actually a german and, and speaks yiddish mm. and that's why he was in the show and it just it's just extraordinary to watch how they made it, how they made those hats and how they got the costumes and how they fitted it all together and in Berlin. It was just, it's phenomenal, but it really, I think it's really profound to watch that bit at the end and just all that little series at the end that tells you all about the making of it. Nicely it handled, amazing. Amanda. Thank you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> You're scared. No, I You're scared leave. me I for lo- a second there. I, ab- no, I absolutely <laughs> loved it. But watching that put so much of it together and so much of the history and you, you know, you you found how real it really all was Absolutely. by the way they are making it. It's just fantastic. It's wonderful. It's a great uh, reminder. Thank you. But I think, Ben, what's interesting about this new way that we consume television and streaming and the like is that I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people, and I'm one of them, who might even go to the extras first before you even watch the TV show because the making of the behind the scenes, the extras, the actors commentary and the like, that's now uh, a normal and much expected part of the new streaming shows that we get. Yeah, I love I love the peek behind the creative process because it's so different for all shows. That's It's a really, I love seeing the kind of initial spark of an idea and how people run with an initial spark of an idea. And I love watching... Um, 
when people have to adapt something for a book, what they take from the book and what they change from the book. So I particularly loved um, Feldman talking about how she was scared that the show was going to make her look like a victim. But then she was um, she was delighted to see that they actually made the character stronger than her. And so she got to have kind of like a fantasy of seeing what she wished she could have said to her in-laws and yes. stuff like that. So yeah. finding out things like that when you and, and kind of going, why, why do people make the creative choices they do? And to go, we'll go film this in... Berlin and to go, how can Berlin look like Brooklyn? That in my mind, I'm going completely different um, parts of the world. But the the genius of them, which is obviously a budget thing, and so that's that thing of um, how do you uh, stay creative within a tight budget? Yes. Um, to be able to be creatively go, no, we can make Berlin look like all these different places is so it's so exciting to kind of see that stuff. So many people on text also suggesting Schitzel, which is on Netflix, which is set in the ultra-Orthodox community in Jerusalem. And uh, my dear colleague Ben Knight is texting me about that as well. number of people on text saying that Schitzel is your next go-to uh, that after that. Um, uh, Dean has called in from Richmond. Hi, Dean. Oh, good day, Virginia. How are you going? Good, thanks. Good. Look, I, I saw um, Unorthodox. I'm a, I'm a secular member of the Jewish community mm-hmm. and... Uh, I thought it was terrific. I thought it was really good for the public to to discover that uh, that, for example, a small percentage of Jews are actually religious, um, and an equally small percentage are in, in the category I'm in, and that's secular. Mm. And um, you know, uh, I was I was a teacher of one of the people from that, that community in Elston Week, and I gained great insights into how the community functions and, you know, how vulnerable they are and how, how paranoid they can be. Uh, for example, um, in his community, um, of over 300 people in the congregation, not one of them owns a dog. And whenever a dog would come up to him, he thought, if I touch the dog, I'd die. Whoa. Um, th- th- there's an extraordinary amount of superstition and old world uh, craziness in the community and they're, uh, they're really enclosed and they really feel that they're under attack. Well, yeah, and, and that really comes through in the show. Good to hear from mm. you, Dean, as well. Yeah, ben, um, Schitzel is clearly the next one that we go to, but according to almost everyone who's texted and called in this morning, it's uh, two thumbs up. Well, okay, we'll have a crack at that one, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm so happy that people have enjoyed this because it's one of those things when you watch something and you go, oh, my God, I hope this is as exciting to everyone else and it's really cool to hear that it has been. It's also one of those smart shows that doesn't say or tell too much. It requires no. you as a viewer to do some work and some thinking and use some emotional intelligence to join the dots, and I, I love that too. No, 100%. It treats you like an adult. It's good. Ben, always good to chat. Thanks so much. My true pleasure. See you soon. Ben Michael there, the head lecturer of the Masters of Screenwriting course at the VCA. Great to hear from all of you as well. Wonderful observations this morning.